Welcome to the Meaningful Work Matters podcast. I'm your host, Andrew Soren, founder of Eudaimonic by Design. On this podcast, we'll dive into the world of meaningful work, explore its complexities, and examine its impact on people and the organizations they're a part of. Each episode features insightful conversations with cutting edge experts who are successfully navigating the challenges of meaningful work. We hope to offer you ideas, frameworks, and tools to unlock potential and design work that's fulfilling, impactful, and supports everyone's well-being. Subscribe or follow us now, and let's make meaningful work matter. Jeff Thompson, welcome to the podcast. I am so glad that you are here. Maybe you can start just by introducing yourself, telling us a little bit about your connection to meaningful work, maybe even what makes your work meaningful. Thank you, Andrew. Pleasure to be with you today. So for me, the exploration of meaningful work is really an autobiographical journey, sort of sense-making of my own career. (laughs) I think like many students, I was a lost soul as an undergrad, changed my major many times. I knew that I wanted something for my career that would allow me to uh, help people to to do something that was meaningful to me. I had no idea what that was. I uh, ended up in an MBA program and was equally lost there trying to find my way. Um, ended up working for a little while for a corporation in the retail industry. I had a headquarters job in organizational development. And that seemed like it would be a good place for me to sort of, you know, build people and contribute and hopefully find meaning there. It was the opposite. <laughs> I, <laughs> I, uh, I was really sort of battered by that corporate experience. The competitiveness it was a culture that was a pretty harsh and very bottom line driven. I observed a lot of things that bordered on corruption And my time in that corporation just left me feeling completely devoid of purpose. And uh, it was a a bit of an existential crisis. Like, what am I doing here? And how can I craft a career that I am, I feel personally satisfied, but more importantly, like I'm contributing to something good. It was really a jolt to me. Um, It was after that that I really discovered the field of organizational behavior, the field of business ethics, ended up getting a PhD almost as therapy to kind of make sense of what I'd been through. And I had a really strong focus as I went into my PhD program that I wanted to do something academically that would make organizations safe for people and create places where people could express their values at work. I had not yet gotten clear enough and articulate enough that I knew I wanted to study meaningful work, but there was something in that space. And I wanted to help other students, other young people like me be able to find that that (laughs) sense of resonance in their work. So as I studied my PhD at the University of Minnesota, I ended up on a research team that was studying change in healthcare. And this was kind of a, a macro OB approach to understanding changing systems. But the piece of that project that I kind of carved out for myself was understanding how physicians were transitioning from being private practitioners to becoming basically employees of a large corporate entity. (laughs) They were miserable, like really unhappy about this change. So I spent hours and hours interviewing doctors who were grappling with this sense of being sucked into a, a corporate monolith and felt like they were losing a piece of their identity. And as I talked to them, I'm like, I can kind of relate to this and felt a lot of empathy for them. But in my interviews, and this wasn't part of the project, but I kept interjecting it because I wanted to ask, it's like, why are you a doctor? What is it about this profession? And those questions provided me the moments that were the transition for me, because when they talked about being a healer, I would see a light come into their eyes and a sense almost of reverence for the work that they do. And even the most embittered physician that I was interviewing had this deep underlying sense that what they were doing was right for them, Mm -hmm. was a contribution that was focused on individuals they were helping. It It was moving and it was sort of like, that. That's what I'm looking for. That's what I want to study. And that was sort of the catalyst for me, ultimately reorienting my research to focus on 
how individuals discover a sense of calling and what does that mean and how do you get there and what's the experience like and how do you nurture that and how does it get you into trouble? Um, so that's sort of my uh, biographical introduction into the field of meaningful work. I'm already in love with the fact that your storytelling capacity, so exquisite. I'm enwrapped. I'm enwrapped. So to tell us a little bit about what is a calling from what you have gleaned from that personal experience to the professional years of research. What, what is a calling? Yeah, well, there's a lot of water under the bridge between that moment and, to, and, and the point where <laughs> I begin to articulate what a calling is. Obviously, there are a lot of academic definitions and people are still kind of wrangling over what it means. Mm -hmm. But I'll give the definition that I give my students. This is sort of where the rubber hits the road in the, in the classroom, right? And what lights students up. So I define a calling as that place in the arena of professional work where your natural gifts and abilities and passions meet a cause, uh, meet a mm -hmm. purpose that beckons to you. It's that confluence of, of three things. I, I talk about passion, purpose, and place. Passion being those intrinsic gifts and, and orientations, the, you know, the, the inside out part of what I need to express. The purpose being a problem that calls to me or a, a group of people or, or an, an entity that needs the gifts that I have. Hmm. And the sense of place being like, oh, I'm where I'm supposed to be. I have, you know, life has fortuitously brought me to this moment where what I can offer is the same thing as what is needed in my environment. Hmm. That wasn't a very uh, elegant or concise uh, definition. Oh my gosh. No, I love it. I'm also, I'm also a very big fan of alliter alliterative frameworks. So passion, purpose, and place works for me as a calling uh, definition. I, I think that that's, I think that's exquisite. It's also, it's also very eudaimonic. It's very, it feels, it feels like if we, if we were to ask Aristotle what meaningful work could be, he'd probably give a, a pretty similar answer in terms of uh, passion, purpose, and place. Um, and the practice, he might, he might add like a, a fourth piece around the deliberate practice of that over time. But yeah, um, possibly. It, it's yeah. funny you mentioned eudaimonism because my MBA ethics class, I fell in love with eudaimonic theory, and it's been an orienting framework for me uh, throughout mm -hmm. my career. Mm -hmm. Me too. So I run a business called Eudaimonic by Design. It's a, it's a crazy name, but it's an incredible idea. Yes. Um, well, let, let's say starting with Aristotle, I don't know, maybe even earlier that this whole idea of a calling I know is situated in lots of historical perspectives. It's really evolved and is seen in different ways throughout the literature. Can you just tell us a little bit about the ways in which the idea of a calling have evolved historically? Yeah, in fact, that was an interesting journey for, for me and my primary co-author, Stuart Bunderson. When we began our research on the zookeeping profession, which is kind of, I don't know, if somehow we've become the zookeeper guys. I, I, I will never, I've sort of been typecast now um, by that study. When we started studying zookeepers, we really didn't have a calling lens. We were interested in what made people passionate about their work. And we were kind of focused on uh, how are people motivated by a cause. And we sort of expected to interact with zookeepers who were sort of global conservationists and had a belief that they were saving the planet and incidentally were doing that by helping animals. And that really wasn't what we found. We found people who were first and foremost oriented toward their animals serving their particular, either a species or their, their animal that they're, that they're with day in and day out. And it was really zookeepers who started, who, who attuned us to the concept of calling because they talked about it all the time. Like, this is my call. I have to do it. This is my niche. This is where I have to be. And mm -hmm. it was then that we started saying, okay, what is, what is this calling idea and where does it come from? And it took us back essentially to Martin Luther and the Protestant Reformation, which is the first introduction of the idea that a profession work for a living could also be a calling prior to Luther's time, the very concept of work was sort of distasteful. Work was something that you 
needed to do well if you were you know an early early roman or greek like you tried to escape work to pursue the the more sublime acts of of artistic creation um and that was you know how slavery was justified as we have to have someone to do our work so that our society can flourish even in the religious arena you know sort of early biblical traditions are that adam and eve were cursed with work uh, because of disobedience and in the monastic lifestyle you escaped the world of work in order to come close to god so martin luther really changed the game by saying that work can be a partnership with god to bless god's children and he brought this sense of nobility to work so the interesting thing about the word calling it has these deeply religious roots mm -hmm. uh, it comes very much from this protestant tradition and yet it is now a secular term like you don't mm -hmm. have to have any particular religious belief to talk about oh i found my calling in life and um there's some tricky things about that because and i'll go back to the sociologist max weber who said if i can get this quote right he said uh, the, the idea of a calling is like the ghost of dead religious beliefs that you know that somehow haunt us today so the tricky thing about that yeah is that I think the students that I teach, and I think just sort of culturally, people now expect to have meaningful work and they're seeking mm -hmm. calling. They want this sense of being called to something, but there's not really a narrative about who's doing the calling as there was in the Martin Luther's day that this was sort of a, you know, something given by God. And so it's kind of become this mystical pursuit mm -hmm. to find my bliss, to find, you know, a euphoric work experience that somehow we feel entitled to, we feel haunted by, uh, mm -hmm. to quote Max Weber. And so I think a lot of students really struggle. It's one of the reasons I love teaching about calling is because there's this hunger for it, but we've kind of left it a little mysticized. It makes me think about the idea of calling anxiety or purpose anxiety or passion anxiety, right? Like, the, yeah. what if I don't feel that sense of a calling? What, yeah. what, is there something wrong with me? Yeah, I hear that all the time. Yeah. We're going to get into the zookeepers in a bit because, sure. boy, oh boy, that article had a big impact on me. Um, it's a it's a beautiful, beautiful article. But I want to actually think a little bit about, I mean, when you and Stuart recently published an annual review article that kind of looked at all of the research that had been done on calling. And one of the things that you do is you look just at the sheer number of articles around this theme, around this this idea of a calling over the last couple of decades, and especially over the last 10 years, and almost an exponential growth of the number of articles that have been written. I mean, certainly within the topic of meaningful work more broadly, half of all articles written about meaningful work have been written since 2019. Like there's, there's just a huge amount of interest, it seems like, in this topic from, from people in psychology, from people in business, from people in sociology, that, from a whole whack of different fields. Why do you think that is? Why do you think that this topic right now is so, is hitting a nerve? Mm, that's such a great question. Having been in the classroom for almost 25 years now, I've observed a shift. I think the idea of calling and purposeful work has always resonated with students. But I think the, our current generation, and perhaps it's, it's because of increased access to information and stories, I think there is a deepening sense of a desire for meaningful work. I think our rising generation has been empowered with the idea that an individual can make a difference. The media and social media celebrates those sorts of things. And I, I think there's perhaps an increased sense of possibility among the rising generation they can do well, but also do good. Um, I really sense that ethos being more pronounced among the students that I'm teaching today. That being said, I talk about calling all the time. I, I present everywhere. I've, I've written on the topic and I've always kind of thought my message is for young people who are launching their careers. It's not just, it's not just them. I probably have as much people reaching out to me who are mid-career or late career saying, I'm still looking for this and what can I do at my stage of, of my career? So I don't know. I, I feel like it is an in, inherent 
human urge to matter. I don't say matter in a way of self-importance, but to leave a, a mark, to leave a legacy of, of good, to be remembered or to have contributed somehow. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I guess my answer to your question is, I don't know, but it's really cool. I mean, I, I love this human striving for purpose mm -hmm. and meaning because I think it is rooted in a desire to do good and a desire to help. And I find that inspiring. Mm -hmm. The idea of mattering is extremely interesting. In fact, there'll be there'll be other people that we have on this podcast, Isaac Pelantensky as one who focuses very much on this idea of mattering. He defines mattering as as uh, as feeling valued and being able to add value. And there's been wonderful studies, for example, in the nursing profession. A colleague of mine, Julie Hayslip, looks at nurses and says nurses come into the field because they think it's a it's deeply meaningful work. They're often feeling like there's a sense of calling, but they only stay if they feel like they matter within that context, that that's like a key differentiator. When I started talking uh, or shared the article around meaningful work that led me to you with Martin Seligman, his response was, you know, meaningful work is important, but I actually think that mattering is what people are actually looking for. So yes, mattering, mattering is important. Yeah. You have this idea in the, in the annual review article, you talk about the idea of transcendent calling. Can you tell us a little bit about what that means? Yeah, that was, uh, so that was another um, article I co-authored with Stuart Bunderson. We were kind of grappling with this, almost felt like, a, uh, I'm overstating this, but a, a stalemate in the literature, this fundamental definitional difference between whether a calling was about your passions and the things that you wanted to do and needed to express versus a calling being this external external call to solve a problem or to serve in some way. And it, it kind of felt like the literature was in some ways getting stuck between these two different conceptualizations. And we had this really fortuitous moment where we encountered Abraham Maslow's 1967 piece, often overlooked, where he basically says, Guys, I, I didn't quite get the pyramid right. That like the hierarchy of needs, I'm missing a level. And he and this is near the end of his life. And he he basically says, beyond self-actualization, there's something called self-transcendence. <laughs> where you're you're taking your actualization, which is sort of about self-expression of the best within you, and you're finding where it fits. He makes an argument that there is a sublime matching that sometimes happens when your self-actualization meets a need. And that is sort of like the highest level of, uh, mm. and he called it, you know, a, a transcendent level of motivation. And that just, that rung so many bells for Stuart and me as we were reading about that, reading that article and recognizing that both of these components, and, and he called it, and we are calling it inner requiredness and outer requiredness, come into alignment. So a transcendent calling in that article, we're, we're really trying to articulate the sense of, hey, it, do, it doesn't matter which angle we come from. Like when we sit down and talk to our calling colleagues, everyone agrees that both of these components make mm -hmm. calling even better. We just kind of come from different starting places. Mm -hmm. um, so a transcendent calling is is kind of what I talked about. It's that it's that match between where your passion, you know, your ability, your gift, your expression aligns with the outer requiredness of something that is beckoning to you. Mm -hmm. Another person who's been on this podcast, Scott Barry Kaufman, who wrote a wonderful book that was looking at Maslow specifically, and um, and it's called Transcend and Reimagining to a certain extent some of the places that we've gone wrong with Maslow, and especially the idea of the whole pyramid, which was not something that Maslow actually ever advocated for. But yes, you articulated that beautifully. Do you think that culture or a religion or even socioeconomic status matter when it comes to that kind of transcendent calling? Oh, that's that's a big question. So um, <laughs> despite the fact that calling has its roots in religiosity, in the zookeeper study I mentioned to you, there was this consistent theme of people feeling guided or led or like 
fate had smiled upon them. But but there was also not a single zookeeper who attributed that to a religious belief. It was just this sort of sense of gratitude of, you know, of the hand of fate or of of life guiding me in the right way, or maybe it was my my passions were so pronounced that it led me in the right direction. So no, I don't I don't think there is a, a religious prerequisite here in any way. Even though I, I have spoken with many people who feel a religious call, I have spoken to more people uh, who don't assign any particular religious attribute. Culturally, I think we're seeing research happening in a lot of different cultural traditions. And I think the terminology differs, but there is a resonance with the idea of meaning and, and purpose seeking that I, I believe is universal. Socioeconomic status, this is where it gets thorny because the biggest pushback that I get from audiences, from, set, from, from lay people audiences, is this a concept of privilege? Mm -hmm. Is it a luxury to be able to pursue a calling? Because often it entails some level of financial sacrifice or it entails specialized education. And so that is, a, I think, a significant challenge that the field of calling research needs to deal with. I can share with you my, my gut instinct. <laughs> <laughs> Please, I can't yet back it up with, with data, um, because calling often involves sacrifice, and sometimes it involves financial sacrifice. I found it useful to think about calling less as a destination, uh, less as a pursuit of a dream job, and more as a way about a way of thinking about how I contribute. I've had the opportunity to travel pretty extensively in, in West Africa, I spent a lot of time in Ghana. And I was not there to study people at work. I was there taking students on a, a study abroad experience um, multiple times. But in interacting with people, I observed this sense of fulfillment in gratitude for the work that people found to do, even if it would sort of not align with Western standards of what a great job might be, a sense of gratitude, and often a sense of really pursuing excellence in the thing that you're doing to support your family, even though resources were much less munificent than we're accustomed mm -hmm. to in the West. I have often been humbled in talking to people who are doing work that I, from my privileged standpoint, might not naturally value, but to gain a sense of, of the reverence they have for their work. Let me tell a story, if that's Please. okay. Yeah. My prior university, there was a woman named Barb who was uh, the custodian, was responsible for my floor. And she would come through my office every afternoon, late in the afternoon, to empty the trash and sort of, you know, clean things up. She'd run a vacuum or whatever. And she was just this this tiny little live wire of a of a woman, just a, a bustle of activity and always had a kind word and was just so cheerful. And as I got to know her, she started asking me if there were things she could clean in my office. Like if I if there was anything. I wanted her to do for me. And I thought, I'm not going to give her extra jobs. I, I just felt like, why would I ask her to clean something when she's already cleaning? But she persisted in asking me that. And I, I finally realized, I think she actually wants to, like she would like that. And so I, I, I don't think I ever did ask her to do anything special. But one day I said, Barb, tell me about your job. Like, I, I see you doing this with so much energy. And she just kind of lit up and she said, I am so grateful that I have the opportunity to be part of a university to make it better. Like, I just, I feel so lucky that I get to do this and I, I love being here. And I was really, I was humbled because I think that day I was crabby about, you know, grading papers or my research and taking for granted the fact that it is a magical thing to be part of a university, this vibrant community of learning. But Barb taught me something about calling. 
she knew what she was good at. She knew that it mattered. She knew that she was contributing to something that was bigger than herself. It's a very long-winded answer to say, does socioeconomic status, is it a precondition or calling? And I don't think so. I don't want to think so. I believe that as we discover our gifts, that virtually anyone can find a way to meaningfully contribute with those gifts. Hmm. It's a beautiful answer. I have no idea. I want to see the, I want to see the evidence, <laughs> but uh, I want to applaud you in the thoughtfulness in which you consider that story. I mean, it's one of the things that I have so respected about the work that you and Stuart Bunderson have done. And it, it kind of takes us to this, the zookeeper article. Before we do, I'll, I'll say that there's, it's interesting to to hear you talk about gender. Genders are, there's actually a whole entire genre of people who are exploring, who explore dirty work in the, that's the the kind of whether or not you can find meaning. I think Ashworth and Craner is one of the, the kind of classic articles um, that explores the relationship between purpose and um, and doing dirty work. But it's an interesting place where people can be doing the exact same job and see that job. You know, the cognitive reframing of that job, as Amy Rosneski would say, are vastly different. The exact same job, but seen in very, very different ways. Yeah. Zookeepers. So in, uh, I think, 2009, you and Stuart wrote this, this article that's called The Call from the Wilds, Zookeepers, Callings, and the Double-Edged Sword of Deeply Meaningful Work. And... Uh, an exquisite article is possibly behind a paywall. So people might not easily be able to, to read it, but it's, um, if you want a copy, email me and I'll, I'll happily <laughs> find a way to share it with you because it's, it's such a beautiful, beautifully written article and carefully considered and carefully researched in, uh, in just a way that I, I found deeply profound, so profound that it, it certainly launched me on a year of exploring different ways in which meaning can both be a wonderful thing for us, but can also be deeply problematic in different ways. So tell us about zookeepers, Jeff. First off, it was a crazy idea <laughs> to study zookeepers. Stuart and I recognized that we wanted, we wanted to find a, a group of workers, of employees, where we sort of strip away all of the usual incentives. So we talk in our field about job careers and callings, the, the three orientations toward work. And so we wanted to find something that was not a well-paying job to remove the financial incentive. We wanted to find a, a profession where there's not a lot of career incentives. There's not a lot of upward mobility or prestige, but that there was this passion piece. We were trying to isolate passion at the time. And I think we stumbled on to zookeepers by listening to an NPR segment on zookeepers or whatever. We reached out to a local zoo, asked if we could do some interviews. And in doing the interviews, we thought, oh my goodness, what have we stumbled upon? Like we have this group of, of workers, of professionals who make almost poverty level wages. Like you can't make a living being a zookeeper who have nowhere to move upward. There's very little in terms of a career ladder. There's stigmas associated with what it must be like to work as a zookeeper. You're dealing with all kinds of smells and dangers and unsavory things that come along with animal husbandry. And so even though people find the zoo fascinating, they sort of assume the zookeepers are blue collar workers who couldn't get another job. And we found that couldn't be farther from the truth. So you look at that work and you think, what a terrible job. Who would want to do this? But as we started to measure levels of job satisfaction of work meaningfulness, zookeepers are off the charts. Hmm. So we decided to take a very serious look at the zookeeping profession, frankly, assuming this would never get published in the top journal because <laughs> out there, you know, this is not management. It felt like a, a not very smart thing to do before tenure, but we just had to do it because it was such a fascinating group of people and talking to zookeepers was just a joy to hear them express what this work means to them. So that's mm -hmm. the 
genesis of the of the project. And we ended up, in addition to the interviews, there's a qualitative piece and a quantitative piece to the study where we surveyed upwards of 1,300 zookeepers from every major zoo across the country. We found North that. America. I think you were in Canada yeah. too. I'm in Canada. It was remarkable. Our response rates were higher than we usually see. Zookeepers were excited to talk about their work and fill out surveys and so it was a, it was an extremely fortuitous and and exciting and fun project to study zookeepers and really it was zookeepers that took us back to Martin Luther hmm. because what we were expecting was a lot of stories about how fun it is to work with the animals and the joy i get through my work and you know going to work every day is a pleasure that modern notion of work being bliss hmm. um And that's not what they told us. (laughs) They had heartbreaking stories of being underpaid was not a joy to them. Like they feel the sacrifice that they're making. They recognize that they're making tremendous sacrifices. The work is hard. It's backbreaking. You're out in the elements. You don't get appreciated. Sometimes the public says rude things to you. Your animals die. Like you put, you pour your heart and soul into these animals, but they have a shorter lifespan. So you're grieving the loss of, of, an, of an animal that almost feels like your child. It's a brutal profession. And we started to hear in the interviews that this is not a calling despite the fact that it's really hard. It's a calling precisely because it is so hard. Mm. The fact that I am willing to bleed, sweat, and cry for these animals makes it a calling. And um, that that is what makes the work. I try not to get into religious language, but there's like, there's something sacred. There's something reverential about the work that I do. And we thought this is such a shift from kind of the contemporary idea that we're looking for a job that gives us bliss. These are people who are much more in line with the Martin Luther idea that a calling is an obligation. Hmm. It's duty that you shoulder to serve. And thus the double-edged sword, like there is satisfaction, there is joy. I mean, the sublime moment of watching an endangered animal give birth, people in our interviews would weep about those experiences. So there's the, the highest of highs, but there is also these moments of just giving until it hurts. Mm. Um, that doesn't subtract from their idea that it's a calling. It provides more evidence that the, what they're doing really matters. Hmm. It connects back to some of the ideas we were talking about at the beginning around eudaimonia. And in some ways, the fact that eudaimonia, there, there's, nothing, there's nothing inherently pleasurable about a eudaimonic pursuit of life, right? This idea that working to bring the best of yourself to, for that passion, you know, bringing the, the fullest of yourself for a purpose and working in that mastery and making those hard choices and the deliberate practice of all of that can be deeply satisfying, but it can also be filled with suffering. It can be filled with challenge. It can be filled with a lot of angst and potentially misery. And yet, you know, can lead to a life where you feel like it was really worthwhile, like you were really doing something, like you mattered. That was the surprise and it was the prevailing theme. And I, I think it allowed us to, in a way, provide... One, one of our reviewers of the paper described as, as, a, as a correction back the, the roots of calling. And I was happy to be able to tell that story. And I'm, I'm happy to be able, when I talk to students or others, to say, you want a meaningful career, you want work that matters, you need to be prepared to suffer for it. And it's, it's not all suffering. There's a lot of joy in that, in that suffering, but meaningfulness doesn't come cheap. Mm -hmm. You don't see your way into a meaningful career. If it matters, you're going to have to have skin in the game. Hmm. One of the things that I found profound and also disturbing about the article was the fact that it seemed at least to some of the zookeepers, like those who are running zoos had an understanding that they were prepared to work that hard, that they were prepared to to go over time and do more and work more hours and just, and give it all and do it for less money and almost seem to exploit them for the, that calling orientation. Is that a fair, a fair assessment of kind of what, what at least some of them felt? Yeah, it was a narrative that showed up in our interviews. Um, 
zookeepers who would say, you know, I love my animals and I do anything for them, but I try not to wear that on my sleeve because then management will not be incentivized to, to give me a raise. You know, they, they know, they know I'm not going to leave and I'm not, <laughs> you know, the, these folks are, are not even thinking about leaving their animals, but they recognize there's a possibility of that being taken advantage of. So, you know, we, we introduced this idea in the paper of commitment camouflaging. Um, and I, I wouldn't say it was a universal theme by any means, but it did show up that there's this sense of having a calling makes me vulnerable to having that calling exploited. Hmm. I'm curious about how you've seen similar phenomenon in other professions. I mean, it, it strikes me that, you know, you could be equally talking about nurses or educators or nonprofit yep. workers or anyone doing international aid, it, basically anyone doing deeply meaningful work. But I, I mean, have you, have you seen similar phenomenon in other occupations? Yeah, actually, I'm I'm involved in a, a research project right now with some co-authors, and I, I I don't want to say too much about that study just yet without their without their authorization. But as a teaser, we're looking at a, educators who I think have re, every right to feel exploited. Surprisingly, kind of what we're seeing is their sense of calling almost inoculates them against the exploitation. Sort of like recognizing that. The profession is fraught with injustices in terms of pay and that that they've sort of like signed up for this, knowing they, they'd sign up for it and caring for their students is important enough to them that they're willing to make the sacrifice. And so sort of like poking around, looking for people who are feeling deeply exploited, it's almost like they recognize that these inequities happen but the work is so important. I'm willing to go through this. Mm. This is a this is a study of people who have stayed in the profession, and I think mm -hmm. we really need to get to a. And I, I'd love to see more research on people who felt that they had found their calling, but then needed to leave because of the experience of exploitation. So I think that's a mm -hmm. for. for for research. But as we saw with the zookeepers, you know, if your sense of calling is profound enough, you're willing to weather exploitation mm -hmm. because the need of the of the people or animals you're serving is so profound. Now, Jeff, you run <laughs> you run a, a center called the Center for Moral and Ethical Leadership. Mm -hmm. And so I'm curious, how on earth do you translate that into what a leadership imperative might be? In terms of exploitation? Yeah. Yeah. So, so I think the way that I would answer that, I've mentioned that I am a, a eudaimonist. I love eudaimonic philosophy. I'm also part of me as a Kantian. <laughs> and when I think about a center for moral and ethical leadership and the imperative for leaders, I always come back to the notion of dignity that Kant articulated so beautifully. The idea that individuals, because they have agency because they can exercise choice are beyond valuing that they are of infinite worth. And what I love about Kantian philosophy is the nobility he assigns to human beings. I think the imperative for leaders when they are entrusted with leading people who have a sense of calling is to maintain foremost in their mind the nobility of the offering that a calling is. Hmm. And it's easy to take advantage of that because you don't have to think about what do I do to motivate this person? But I think it is imperative for a leader to recognize on a daily basis that people who are working out of a sense of calling are offering something of inestimable worth and rewarding that accordingly hmm. to be um, to sort of like see themselves as making up the difference in some way between the worth of the offering that a calling is and the tendency of the public to sort of ignore those hmm. offerings. That's maybe a very idealistic view, but I have seen that kind of leadership. Uh, what the, I, can, I, can I ask just like concretely, like what kind of practices have you seen? My primary teaching assignment is with MPA students, Masters of Public Administration. 
So I teach students who are preparing for public sector work, which mm-hmm. makes them very susceptible to the idea of a calling. And I, I think I, I maybe have the most fun teaching our executive MPA students. So these are mid-career people. So I have the opportunity to hear a lot of stories about supervisors and students will bring their stories to the classroom about the worst of leaders and the best of leaders. And uh, I was just asking this question the other night to a group of students. And one of them talked about a supervisor who sort of like acknowledged, I have very limited financial resources that I can put into compensating you the way that you ought to be compensated but I can express gratitude to you. And and she said that she felt like this constant sense of being valued by a supervisor who was generous with gratitude and also generous with opportunities for her to exercise initiative in the space where she worked. Hmm. When, when we talked with zookeepers about what the highlights were of their, of their work, we heard many stories about you know, the zoo gave me the opportunity to go to this place and study animals in the wild or gave me an opportunity to go to this conference or to be part of a community of, of thought. I think when we can't pay extra money to honor callings, we can give people latitude to exercise their calling in ways that allow them to take initiative to exercise that agency, that choice they have to do good their own particular way. Thank you for <laughs> for rising to the challenge of answering those questions. Sure. Um, I'm curious if I if if you were talking to somebody who felt to that deep sense of calling and wasn't in the fortunate position to have uh, to have a leader who saw their nobility and tried to rise to the challenge of of honoring it. What advice would you give to somebody who had a calling and also wanted to try to mitigate the risks of the dark side for themselves? Mm. So I think there are actually two questions in what you've just uh, Mm. shared with me. Good. I've given you a double-barreled question. That's right. On the side of sort of what what do you do when you are exercising your calling, but you have a supervisor who's not honoring that. Mm-hmm. I, I hear that story a lot. I think the lateral community that you can build can be mm-hmm. a resource. Zookeepers talked about themselves as bands of brothers in a way. And many of the zookeepers we talked about felt like they did not get much support from management, that management was sort of like misguided in in where they allocated resources that should be going to the animals and were going to marketing programs instead. And so there is a lot of, there's a lot of discontent about management among zookeepers, but it's almost like I'm going to band together with my like-minded zookeepers and we're going to advocate for the animals and we're going to be the the squeaky wheel in this organization that demands mm-hmm. the grace that our animals need. And that's not necessarily a fun role to have to take, but they did find solidarity in community. And so I think finding like-minded people to derive energy from is one thing you can do while you advocate for your mm-hmm. cause. The second question you asked, though, is sort of like, how do you mitigate the risks of, of the dark side of a calling? And this might not be the answer you're looking for. If you mitigate those risks, you run the risk that it's no longer a calling. Mm. Like if you, I think you need to shoulder the fact that a calling is an offering that requires sacrifice. So one of the, the dark sides that we talked about in the paper is that zookeepers with a calling tend to adopt a moral view. They become the moral compass of the organization. They see it as their role to remind management why what they do is so important. And that's hard. It's it's like a, it's a daily battle. It's a crusade that they pursue. If that suddenly got easy for them, you know, part of them would be like, oh, great, now we can just do our work. But also, there's a piece that if, if you're no longer having to champion it, then is that offering as meaningful? So I don't, I think... In the article, we wanted to prepare people for the dark side, but not necessarily to say, and you can just avoid that. 
Right. So not, to, not, not take away the dark side, but just yeah. to recognize there is one. Yeah. yeah. Uh, it just makes me think that so much of the, the philosophical work on meaning is existential in nature. There's suffering that is part of what meaning is. And that's an interesting, it's just an interesting lens to think about all of this. Jeff, thank you so much for joining us on this co- podcast. I have I have learned so much from this. I am so I'm so grateful for your generosity and um, just thank you, thank you. Well, it's a pleasure, Andrew, and I appreciate your enthusiasm for the topic. I just find it endlessly energizing to talk to people who have a calling, to think about what it means to have a calling, and to find my own because I I really feel fortunate to have figured out what I have to say to the world and to find the people who need that. And, you know, you mentioned I'm directing a center now. That was something I never anticipated doing. I wasn't sure that it would be part of my calling. And now that I'm in it, I realize, oh, life has once again brought me to a place where I can sharpen and hone what it is I have to contribute. And it's it's a challenge to pursue a calling, There's a lot of uncertainty along the way, like I had as a young person, but I feel like if you're committed to pursuing the quest for a calling, life is generally fortuitous in giving you opportunities to serve the way you want to serve. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you for joining us for another episode of Meaningful Work Matters. If you haven't already done so, be sure to subscribe to our podcast on your favorite platform. And if this episode resonated with you, please take a moment to leave us a review. Your feedback helps us make this podcast better and reach more listeners. You can connect with me, Andrew Soren, on LinkedIn or visit www.eubd.ca to learn more about eudaimonic by design. Finally, if what you heard today spoke to you, tell your colleagues and people in your community about our podcast. We really appreciate your support in making meaningful work matter. See you next time.